Hi, I'm Keenan Crane from Caltech, and I'm going to take a look at a fairly fundamental question in geometry processing, which is how do we process surfaces while still preserving important features like texture or mesh quality? And so here are just a couple sort of cartoon examples of what I mean. So first you can imagine I'm an artist who's spent many hours carefully painting and detailing this alien head. But if I try to go back and modify the geometry, I'm also going to mess up this texture that I've worked so long and hard on. A similar story is I'm an engineer who's worked hard to get a mesh with nice 90 degree angles. But again, if I try to modify the surface, I'm also going to degrade the mesh quality. So what I'd really like to have are some tools that naturally respect these kinds of features so that I can just focus on beautifying my alien head or beating up my car without worrying about what's happening to the texture or to the mesh. And so what I'm really looking for in these two examples are transformations that preserve angles, or in other words, conformal transformations. So what we've done in this paper is answered in a pretty conclusive way, the question of what are all the possible ways to transform a surface conformally. So in the past, we could talk about maps into the flat 2D plane, which is useful for things like surface parameterization and planar shape deformation, where the result is completely flat. Whereas now we have a nice characterization that also works in three dimensions, which means we can start to solve all sorts of geometry processing problems. And the really beautiful thing is that at a practical level, nothing really changes. We still have nice sparse matrices and solve simple linear algebra problems. Okay, but a natural question to ask at this point is, why are we so interested in conformal transformations? Well, one way to sort of categorize different types of transformations is to take a look at what happens to tangent planes as we deform our surface. And so a tangent plane can get rotated relative to its neighbors, it can be scaled locally, or it can get sheared. And so for an arbitrary smooth deformation, any of these things can happen. For a conformal map, we ask that there be no shearing, which is why, for instance, textures end up looking so nice. If we also ask that there be no scaling, then we get isometries. And finally, if we say, okay, no rotation, no scaling, no shearing, then all we're left with are congruences, or in other words, global rigid motions. And so as we move from the left to the right on this picture, we go from having a lot of flexibility with the geometry to preserving a lot of the structure of the surface. And so for a given application, we have to ask, what's most important to us? For instance, in these examples we looked at a minute ago, we saw that Smooth deformations are sort of too flexible. They distort our features, like our texture or our mesh. Congruences are obviously way too rigid to do anything interesting. Actually, it turns out that isometries are also way too rigid. So for instance, a sphere can't be deformed isometrically at all. And so in practice, what people look for are so-called as rigid as possible, or in other words, elastic deformations. And these are nice maybe for something like animation because you tend to get good volume preservation. On the other hand, in the conformal case, we ask only for angle preservation, which means we get a lot more geometric flexibility, which means we can take a look at a much broader range of geometry processing tasks. We also get a larger space for certain design applications, like maybe architectural geometry. So this is the case I'm going to focus on today. Our basic setup is to use a differential representation, which means instead of working with the positions, we're going to work with the differential df of position. And for a mesh, all this means is we're going to work with the edge vectors. So now we apply some transformation to the edges. And only at the very end of the day do we try to reconstruct new vertex positions. Of course, if I'm not very careful while manipulating my edges, there's no reason to expect they'll go back together to form triangles. And in this case, we say that the edges are not integrable. In other words, they don't actually come from any mesh. 
So the standard approach here is to use least squares and say, okay, well, just give me the mesh who, whose edges are as close as possible to these ones. The problem is that when we force the edges to go back together in this way, we're going to end up distorting all these important features we've been talking about. And so what we'd really like to have here is an integrability condition. In other words, something that tells us which transformations are valid. And the key to coming up with this condition is to go back and take a careful look at the smooth geometry. Okay, so how do we think about the geometry of a smooth surface? Well, one way to do it is to imagine we have an abstract surface M and a map F that takes each point of M into a three-dimensional space. Now, normally this is just R3, but in our case, we're going to gain a lot more insight by working with the imaginary quaternions. And all this means is every point x, y, z in R3 now becomes a point x, i plus y, j plus z, k in the quaternions h. And so now we can take advantage of this complex quaternion product that makes it easy to express certain geometric relationships. For instance, you may remember that if I have a vector u, and a unit quaternion lambda, then conjugating u by lambda represents a rotation. And so now if I let lambda have some other magnitude, well, I get a rotation and a scaling. Okay, and so this really starts to sound like conformal maps. We have just rotation and scaling. In fact, at this point, we have all the ingredients we need to define spin transformations. So again, if I have an abstract surface M and now two different geometries, F and F tilde, then I'll say F tilde is a spin transformation of F if the differentials are related by conjugation by a quaternion valued function, or put more simply, as we go from one surface to the other, tangent planes just get rotated and scaled. And in fact, it's not hard from here to show that, indeed, spin equivalence implies conformal equivalence. But let's take a look at a more typical situation, which is I start out with just one geometry, so I have a surface mesh, and now I want to come up with a conformal transformation. And you might say, okay, well, just apply a rotation and scaling at each point. The problem is that the result may not be integrable. So we go back to this picture of edge vectors not fitting together. Okay. So independently rotating and scaling at each point isn't good enough. What we need is a more global condition that tells us which transformations lambda are valid. And unfortunately, if we just naively interpret this spin equivalence condition as a constraint on lambda, then we end up with a system of quadratic equations. So lambda appears twice here. And so this is something that's going to be way too hard to solve directly. Okay, but uh, here's a nice observation. On a simply connected domain, if my derivative vanishes, then I must be the derivative of something else. And so it's going to be enough to ask for a lambda that makes the derivative of the right-hand side vanish. And from there, I can drag you through some quaternion calculus. But the real point is that at the end of the day, we get a much simpler linear condition that says lambda is valid if and only if it sits in the kernel of this linear operator d minus rho. And so this is really the central equation in conformal geometry processing. And if you know a little bit about conformal maps, you should think of this as a strict generalization of the Cauchy-Riemann equations to the 3D case. All right, but what is this operator D minus rho? Well, D is something we call the quaternionic Dirac operator, which at least for real valued functions is just the usual gradient. And rho is a real valued function on the surface that we're gonna use to specify a deformation. So, for instance, if I have this sphere and I paint on a function rho that looks like this, so green is positive and pink is negative, then I end up with a surface that looks like this. Green spots bulge out and pink spots bulge in.
And the longer story here is just that rho controls the change in curvature as we go from one surface to the other. And sort of as a side note here, this is actually pretty remarkable that we can prescribe something like curvature and get a surface by just satisfying a linear relationship. Normally, if you want to do something like prescribe curvatures, you have to minimize some kind of nonlinear energy. Okay. But one thing you might ask is, well, does a solution always exist? I can paint all sorts of crazy functions on my surface, but can I always expect to get the desired change in curvature? And very quickly, you realize the answer is no. For instance, on a sphere, the total curvature is bounded from below by a topological invariant, so you could never hope to remove all the curvature. On the other hand, it turns out we can always get what we asked for up to some small constant shift. In particular, if I solve the eigenvalue problem d minus rho lambda equals gamma lambda for the smallest eigenvalue gamma, then that's equivalent to saying I've satisfied my integrability condition above for some new function rho plus gamma. And so this is sort of like you came to me with a grayscale image. I said, I can't work with that image, but I can give you something that looks basically the same, just slightly brighter or darker. Okay, there's a lot going on here, so let me just recap the entire process. You start out with a surface, you paint a scalar function on the surface, you then solve an eigenvalue problem for the function lambda that tells you how to update your differential representation. Now the spin equivalence condition just becomes a linear system. The right hand side is now constant because we know lambda. And so we can solve this for the new geometry of the final surface. So there's the high level procedure. And now the question becomes, how do we actually compute solutions on something like a triangle mesh. So first let me just say where all of these quantities live in the discrete setting. Uh, F is just going to be our usual vertex positions except now encoded as imaginary quaternions. We're also going to put a quaternion lambda at each vertex and a real value rho on each face. And now to discretize, well we just integrate our smooth operators over each face. This is a standard finite element approach. And so our Dirac operator now becomes a face vertex adjacency matrix where the entries are basically the edge vectors divided by the triangle areas. Rho is even simpler. We get this matrix R that averages values from vertices to faces and then multiplies by the value of rho stored in each face. Finally, we take the difference, this matrix A, and look for the smallest eigenvalue of A star A. But the point here is really just that the system is really easy to build. We have just some diagonal matrices and adjacency matrices. And as a result, we get a system with a really familiar structure, just a positive definite matrix where each row depends only on the vertex one ring. And even though we have this eigenvalue problem to solve, what does this mean in practice? It just means we prefactor our matrix, and then we iteratively apply back substitution. And so even with a random initial guess, we may only need to apply a few iterations. Or if we're just slightly more intelligent and start lambda at the identity, we might need only a single iteration of back substitution. And so the overall cost is just something like a linear solve. Okay, so once we have lambda, uh, our spin equivalence condition, again, just becomes a linear system because the right-hand side is now constant. And what does this mean for our mesh? Well, remember that df, the differential, is just our edge vectors. Lambda tells us how to rotate and scale these edges to get new target edges E tilde. And then we want to find the new vertex positions F tilde that come as close as possible to these edges, which we do by solving a least squares problem. And this just amounts to a standard Poisson problem. Now at this point you might object and say, why are you using a least squares problem? Didn't you say earlier that least squares was going to distort our surface? Well, because we have this integrability condition to prevent conformal distortion, all least squares is doing is taking care of any remaining discretization error. 
So for instance, if I have this round sphere and I want to add random bumps like this, then as I refine my mesh more and more, all the error goes away. And what you can see here is the quasi-conformal error, which just measures the amount of shear in each triangle. I can be a bit more quantitative and check that as the average edge length decreases, the error decreases linearly, which is about what you'd expect from a linear finite element discretization. We can also check that the quality of the results uh, don't depend heavily on the quality of the mesh. So here I'm taking a disc and tessellating it with nice round triangles. And I can add some kind of bump. And then if I repeat this experiment with a lower quality mesh, you see that the geometry really doesn't change much. So that's good. Okay, so now that we have this nice framework, let's take a look at some geometry processing applications. And of course, the most straightforward thing to do given our setup is to take some surface and paint on a function rho. So if we paint something uh, that looks like a height map, we get something that looks like this face. And a nice thing about having this scalar representation of our geometry is that we can now apply all sorts of standard image filters and get the resulting effect on the mesh. And often this can be nicer than building some kind of mesh-based energy. Of course, you can do a similar thing with normal displacements, but if you compare with what you get with these conformal displacements, it's going to make a pretty big difference in terms of what happens to the texture. Now, not everybody wants to work with surfaces by painting on them. So in our paper, we describe a way to take a mesh, edit it in a completely arbitrary way. So you might use handle-based deformation. Here I've used some commercial editing tool. And then very easily, we can come up with a nearby conformal deformation. Here's just another example where we take um, this giraffe, and we can do some pretty crazy things to this guy but the texture uh, remains looking nice. And so the real point here is that even though at the computational level everything is framed in terms of painting functions on a surface, the user is free to edit the surface in whatever way they please. Another cool thing we can do is we can preserve the appearance of a surface while modifying its boundary. So here we take this rhinoceros head, and completely change the neckline while still preserving the way the ears and the eye and the horn look. And all we have to do here is set rho to zero, say that we don't want to change the curvature at all on the interior of the domain, and then solve with appropriate boundary conditions. Actually, this same setup gives us a really nice way to compute minimal surfaces, which are these zero mean curvature things that sort of look like soap bubbles. And so again, the idea is we start out with something uh, with the curvature we want, in this case, something completely flat, and then we keep this curvature the same as we modify the boundary. And so immediately we get a minimal surface with the added bonus that the triangle quality is preserved. So this is in contrast to a more traditional approach, which is to do some kind of gradient descent until we reach equilibrium. Maybe we have to remesh our triangle along, triangles along the way because they get degenerate and so forth. Whereas here we can just get the solution in a, in a single solve and we know we're going to get something nice. Okay, so as we take a look at all these different experiments, we start to get a feel for just how flexible conformal transformations are in three dimensions. And I think the main point here is just that this is a class of transformations that really makes sense for geometry processing. I think often when people hear the word conformal, they think about some funny special condition for surface parameterization. But if you go back to this diagram we had about all the different types of uh, transformations we can apply to a surface, you realize that conformal is one of only really a couple ways we can even hope to process geometry while still preserving some amount of structure. And so I think it's really important to understand what all the possibilities are here, especially since computationally this is not a big deal. And so to aid in the exploration process, we're putting some code online 
I, I also want to mention that this Dirac operator we've been working with turns out to have a lot of nice applications outside of just conformal geometry processing. So right now we're taking a look at ways to compute really robust surface flows. Um, it turns out the Dirac operator is also absolutely fundamental when it comes to building discrete differential operators. So in one framework we can build not only intrinsic operators like div, grad, and curl, but also extrinsic things like the shape operator. So there's a lot more to come. Stay tuned. And thanks for your attention.